So at this point, you have a reasonably sophisticated one-dimensional finite difference time domain code. We're using a total field scatter field source. We're using, using the perfect boundary conditions for absorption. We're doing Fourier transforms. We're calculating transmission and reflection. And we're also visualizing the fields. Well, it turns out there's other things that we can consider that make our finite difference time domain even more accurate and more useful. The concepts we'll talk about in this lecture, while I'm focusing on one dimensional finite difference time domain now, uh, it certainly applies to any dimension finite difference time domain. So I really could have called this lecture just enhancing finite difference time domain. But these are some more advanced concepts. Um, particularly, we'll talk about convergence, which is really, really important. The first thing we'll talk about is a pure sine wave source. Right now, we have excited our device with an impulse. And where we're interested, we record the impulse response. And if we Fourier transform that, we get the spectral response over an incredibly broad range of wavelengths in one simulation. There are times, however, where maybe we want to excite our device with a pure sine wave source. And there's some subtleties to doing this that we'll cover. The next thing we'll talk about in more detail is the grid dispersion. Now remember the pulses that were traveling across our grid. We started to see some, some ringing at the trailing edge. That was due to grid dispersion. A wave traveling through this Yi grid actually propagates just a small amount slower than a physical wave would because it's interacting with a Yi grid, whereas a physical wave is not. And so it turns out we can predict that and we can compensate for it in many circumstances. Convergence. This is the biggest thing that we'll, we may even talk about all semester, but it's definitely the biggest thing in this lecture, and maybe I shouldn't have put it in the middle here uh, in this order. I should have put it first or something, but convergence. Essentially, we're, we're looking at the grid resolution and the, the time step parameters. And imagine running a simulation, calculating transmission and reflection, and looking at that result. Then we will increase the resolution of our grid. We'll use more points, maybe a smaller time step and then recalculate transmission and reflection. And we compare those two. And what we, we look at is a trend. As we're increasing the resolution of our model, it's getting more and more accurate, but it's taking longer and longer to run. And we look at the convergence of our answer. At some point, we increase the grid resolution and get negligible changes in the answer. At that point, we say that our model has converged. And this is something you should always, always do. You would never report an answer from your model without doing a number of, of things. One, checking for conservation of energy. And then two, convergence. Keep cranking up the resolution of your model until the answer doesn't change much anymore, and that's called convergence. Then we'll also talk about incorporating loss. Right now, our materials are just the permeability and permittivity without any loss built in. So what are some subtleties when we do that? Then even more complicated, what if, they're, if the materials are frequency dependent? I'll show you a pretty neat way of doing that here, although there's lots of other ways using Z transforms and, and other things. So remember our Gaussian source. There was really two properties that we were using to control our Gaussian source. We had the period or the duration, not the period, the duration of this pulse which really controlled its frequency content. And in fact, we calculated the duration of the pulse based on the bandwidth we want that pulse to contain. And then we also had the offset. And the purpose for the offset was that we would not begin in the middle of this pulse somewhere. We would start off where the this pulse is zero, and we would ease into the source and then ease out of it. So that theme of easing into the source and easing out of it is something we need to consider with a pure sine wave source. We don't want to just turn on the sine, the sine wave source. We want to somehow ease into it. So in fact, we're going to use this Gaussian again, but combine it with a cosine or a sine function. So here is what our source would look like uh, over the duration of the simulation. Notice it starts off zero. It's always a pure sign, but we put this envelope on top of it to ease into that source. And so the way we express our source, we'll still use GT for the generic source. It has some amplitude envelope times a sine wave, 2 pi FT. So clearly the sine term is responsible for this. The slow envelope is that A term. And here we're using a Gaussian. 
And we're going to define this to be a Gaussian for the first half, but once it reaches its maximum, it will stay 1. So that's how we're defining it here, and then these, these intermediate parameters. So this is how we'll calculate our source as a function of time for a sine wave. On to grid dispersion. First, we need to review what a wave vector is. You should have had this in your electromagnetic theory before this. But in short, a wave vector carries two pieces of information. Um, it has a direction because it's a vector. It points in the direction that the wave is traveling or the direction that phase appears to be traveling. It's always normal to the wave fronts. And I'm drawing a picture of that at the bottom here. It's normal to the wave fronts. The second piece of information that it includes is the period. The magnitude of the k vector is 2 pi divided by the wavelength, which is the spatial period of the wave. Many times we know the frequency of our wave, which means the free space wavelength is fixed. And we can write this in terms of the refractive index. So it's 2 pi times refractive index over the free space wavelength. So over here, it's really this the wavelength inside the material that can change to change the amplitude of k. But if we know the frequency and the free space wavelength is fixed, we can also think of the magnitude of k as conveying the refractive index information. If the wavelength frequency is not known, we have to think of it in the first sense of being 2 pi over the period. But if the wavelength is known, we can think of the magnitude of k as conveying refractive index. Times a constant, 2 pi over lambda naught would be the constant. So that's our wave vector. Points in the direction of the wave, and its amplitude conveys either wavelength or refractive index. We have what's called dispersion relations. We know that a solution to Maxwell's equations is plane waves. And if we substitute that solution back into Maxwell's equations, turn our algebra crank, out comes an equation which put some constraints on the values the wave vector can take based on the frequency. And so that equation is called the dispersion relation. And for ordinary materials, what we see kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared, this is the magnitude of our wave vector squared is fixed to the frequency divided by the velocity of the wave squared. So that's our dispersion relation for a physical wave. Let's also talk about the concept of an index ellipsoid. So imagine we created a map. Depending what direction a wave is traveling through some strange material, it may see a different refractive index. So if we were to plot that refractive index as a function of direction, in an ordinary material, let's say we're in outer space, we would get a circle because no matter what direction the wave is trying to go, it sees the same refractive index. So strictly speaking, the radius of the circle is the magnitude of the k vector. So if the k vector has the same magnitude no matter what direction it's going, then our index ellipsoid, if you will, is a circle. So k is the direction that phase is traveling. It turns out power, or the group velocity, is defined differently. So power travels in a direction that is normal to the surface. Well, again, if we have a circle, then phase and power are going in the same direction. Well, in other materials, anisotropic materials, metamaterials, photonic crystals, and, and other things, these index ellipsoids can take on shapes other than circles. In fact, they can even be things other than ellipses. and They can look like stars and squares and triangles and all kinds of weird things. But let's look at what happens. Depending on the direction of the wave, the magnitude of the wave vector changes. It would have a maximum in the x direction and a minimum in the y direction. This means that a wave traveling in the y direction would see a smaller refractive index than a wave traveling in the x direction because the magnitude of the k vector is changing. Something else kind of weird happens. So phase would appear to be going in the direction of k. However, power, defined differently now, normal to the surface is pointing in a different direction. So phase and power can go in different directions in anisotropic materials and photonic crystals and, and other strange configurations. The analogy I like to use here is imagine you 
spin in a circle 20 times really fast, get yourself very dizzy, and then you try to run towards a door. Phase is you're trying to go towards the door, so that's phase. That's kind of the way you want to go. Your body's facing that way. However, because you're so dizzy, when you actually start moving, you're, you're going off in a different direction. So your body is actually going another way, even though your intent, where you're looking, is in a completely different direction just due to you being dizzy. So waves and these crazy materials do very similar things, and phase and power can actually go in different directions. So that's the purpose of an index ellipsoid. It's really to map refractive index as a function of direction. So now we're going to take our equations for a plane wave, an arbitrary plane wave, and plug that into our finite difference equations on the Y grid. And we turn the crank, and out comes a new type of dispersion relation. This is a dispersion relation for a wave on the Y grid. And so here's what that looks like. For a fully three-dimensional Yi grid, here is our dispersion relation. So it kind of looks like what we had before. Before we had a kx squared plus a ky squared plus a kz squared equal the uh, uh, omega over v all squared. But now we have some additional terms in here really due to the interaction of the wave with the Yi grid. Well, we can reduce this down to a two-dimensional grid and so that's our two-dimensional dispersion relation, and then also for a one-dimensional grid. And here, V is the velocity of the wave on the Yi grid. So let's think about the limiting case. We have a time step, we have grid resolution parameters, delta X, delta Y, delta Z. Let's let all of those approach zero. So we start off with our numerical dispersion relation, we let those approach zero, and in fact, this dispersion relation approaches the physical dispersion relation of an actual physical wave. So that gives some credence that this really is the correct equation. And it also tells us that as we increase our grid resolution, in other words, make our cell size much, much smaller, decrease the time step size, as all of those approach zero, we will get very accurate answers, but it will also take our simulations an uh, unreasonable amount of time to run as we make those smaller. So there's always this trade-off. So we keep saying a wave on a Y grid slows down a little bit slower than a physical wave would. Let's calculate the actual velocity of the wave on the Y grid. So we can go to our dispersion relation for the 1D grid, and we can solve that for our K. We only have a Z component of this anyway, so this is our wave vector. The velocity of the wave on our grid, the little squiggly means this is a slower than a physical wave would be because it's on the grid, is omega over the K that we calculated up here. So we can calculate our numerical phase velocity. Now, that should equal the physical velocity, but it doesn't, it's a little bit slower. So let's look at this in terms of the index ellipsoids, understand the impact of the time step. So the red line represents the index ellipsoid of our wave on the Yi grid. The dash blue line represents the index ellipsoid for a physical wave. Notice this is bigger the magnitude of the wave vector is bigger. So when the time step is large, we have a, essentially a different refractive index, a smaller refractive index, and that's not accurate. And so as we, in, as we decrease the, the time step and make the time step smaller and smaller, we see that the FDTD solution starts approaching the exact solution. We want those to lie right on top of each other. And so by the time we have about 10 steps per shortest wavelength, or per, per shortest wave cycle, I should say, things start looking pretty good. We can do the same thing for the grid resolution, the X, Y, and Z parameters. So again, the dashed blue line is what a physical wave should see, but because of our grid, the red line is what we see in our finite difference time domain model. Notice this looks more square than it does circle. So in other words, waves traveling in different directions actually start seeing a slightly different 
set of material properties, and that's not good. Well, as we increase the grid resolution, by the time we get to about 10 steps per wavelength, the grid resolution looks pretty darn close to the exact resolution, which is why, or one of the reasons why we always say you want to resolve that shortest wavelength with at least 10 cells. And there are certain configurations where we need more than that. So it's actually possible to compensate for the dispersion. And the way we do this is I'll in include, I call it a correction factor, but it's a fudge factor. So let's say we have a grid filled with some refractive index n. So we can multiply this by a fudge factor. And we can set that equal to exactly C0 over n. So now our numerical phase velocity with this fudge factor built in will be exactly the physical wave velocity. So we can solve this mess for that fudge factor, and here's how we calculate that. And again, I'm not calling it a fudge factor here, it's a correction factor. <laughs> so here's in practice how we can calculate this fudge factor, and it'll usually be less than one, so 0 0.98, 0 0.99, 0 0.9999 uh, are typical numbers for this. And I'll show you how to use the, the fudge factor on the next slide. So our physical wave has slowed down on our grid. We need to speed it up. So if this fudge factor is a little bit less than one, we will take our relative permittivity and relative permeability across the entire grid and multiply it by that fudge factor. That will make them slightly smaller, so this wave will travel slightly faster. So we have the Yi grid, the interaction with the Yi grid, slowing down the wave, so then we make our permittivity and permeability slightly smaller to speed the wave back up and if we've calculated our fudge factor correctly those two will balance out and then our numerical wave will be traveling at the exact same speed as a physical wave. So here's an example. Suppose we construct a one-dimensional finite difference time domain simulation. It's some device in air and it operates around one and a half gigahertz. And so at the beginning of our finite difference time domain, we calculated our parameters this way. Our step size, or the grid size, would be three centimeters, size of our cell. Our time step size is 50 picoseconds. And for the 1.5 gigahertz, our free space wave number comes out to be almost 21 inverse meters. So how do we compensate for the numerical dispersion? First thing is calculate our fudge factor. So we throw in all the numbers that we know, and we get a fudge factor of 0.9877. So here's the MATLAB code for doing this. We calculate our fudge factor, and then UR and ER will be arrays of the relative permeability and relative permittivity across the grid. We just multiply each of those by our fudge factor, and now we've artificially sped up the wave to compensate for this slowing of the wave due to the interaction of the Yi grid. Some final points on this. To remember, and I know I've said this a number of times, but waves on our Yi grid travel slower than a physical wave would because there's more interaction. We have our finite differences. The grid also imposes anisotropic dispersion. Remember that index ellipsoid for a two-dimensional grid looked a little bit more like a square than it did a circle, meaning depending what direction the wave is traveling, the amount that it slows down changes. So it's an anisotropic type of dispersion. So the grid, gives us an anisotropic type of dispersion. The time step, our index ellipsoid, was still a circle. So that only imposed isotropic dispersion. The wave, no matter what direction it's going, it may see the in, an incorrect effective refractive index, but at least it sees the same one in all directions. So that one's isotropic. So if our wave slows down and we don't compensate for it, it kind of looks like our material properties are a little bit larger than they should be. Our waves will travel a little bit slower. Our wavelength gets a little bit compressed. It tends to push the spectral response to lower frequencies or longer wavelengths. And we'll see that. We'll compare different methods at some point during the semester, ones that don't suffer so much from the, this dispersion problem, and we'll see that the spectra truly is shifted to slightly longer wavelengths. Some good news, and I guess it's some bad news too, we can arbitrarily decrease this dispersion simply by going to a finer resolution grid using more points. 
The cost of that is the simulation will take longer to run. So instead, what we can do is then just artificially adjust the permittivity and per permeability. So rather than reduce the dispersion, we compensate for it. And so this is where we, we calculate that fudge factor, multiplied that into the permeability and permittivity, and we've compensated for dispersion. Okay. And as I mentioned, convergence will be the most important topic. It's very simple, but it will, it will give us some work to do when we model a device. So let's say we're modeling something and we're calculating its transmission and reflection response. And let's say we run it here. We're only using two points per wavelength. Well, we know that's not going to be enough ahead of time, but we can, we can try it. We can run it. And here's what we get. Well, then we make the grid resolution higher. We double the number of points we're using per wavelength. Here it's four points per wavelength. Things are looking better. However, notice the jump. Things look a lot different. Well, instead of using four points per wavelength, let's go higher. Let's use six points per wavelength. Notice things have changed a lot still. So clearly this was not a correct answer. Then we jump up to eight points per wavelength. Well, these are looking rather similar. Um, we might start thinking, hey, maybe things are starting to converge. But that's when we jump up to 10 points per wavelength and wow, it jumped again. So it, it won't necessarily be this steady continuum. It can jump around. And so now we have 10 points per wavelength. Then we jump up to 20 points per wavelength. At this point, I don't see much difference. And so I would argue at about 20 points per wavelength or even 10 points per wavelength, somewhere in here, it converges. As we use more points per wavelength, our, the change in our answer will be negligible. However, our simulations will start taking a lot longer. So it's sort of up to us to figure out where we want to be on that convergence trend that we say, this is a converged answer, the simulation is still pretty quick, and we have a reasonable degree of accuracy. So the, the equations that I gave previously for calculating grid resolution and the time step, these don't ensure that we'll get an accurate answer. Think of those as just rules of thumb. It's just a first guess. The, the procedure that's really used to figure out what those need to be is convergence. We'll keep making those numbers smaller and smaller and smaller until the answer doesn't change much anymore and we say that is converged. So that's the technical answer of how we figure out our time step and the grid resolution. What are sufficiently small numbers that we get an accurate answer? We get that by looking at convergence. Here's another way of visualizing the same thing. So here we're plotting transmittance as a function of wavelength. So wavelength along the horizontal axis. So we can see we have some transmittance when the number of points per wavelength, I guess it's one down here. Clearly that's not enough. And so as we use more points per wavelength, we're going upward. And what we can see is these simulations, while they're, they're changing a lot down here, they start changing less and less. And we start seeing convergence maybe for this device, whatever this device might be, I might argue convergence is happening somewhere around 30 points per wavelength. Now we can still observe things still do change and they'll, they'll keep changing. They're just changing by a sufficiently small amount that I would argue, let's use lambda over 30 resolution. That'll give us our answer reasonably quick and it's reasonably well converged. We always know we can go higher, but this is, this is starting to take a lot longer in the simulation. So there really is no hard, fast rule of where this is converged. We have to look at the convergence trend and sort of eyeball where is good enough for us. What kind of accuracy do we need? What type of simulation times do we need, for example? Uh, if I'm running an optimization and I need millions and millions of iterations, I might even say, at least for my first round of optimizations, I might use a, a grid resolution of you know lambda over 15. That way they run really fast, and as my optimization starts to converge, at that point, then I might increase grid resolution to somewhere out here. And as that starts to converge, I might even do my one last final simulation way up here or even up here somewhere. So that's a very common thing for me to do. In fact, I'll admit when I'm developing a code, 
initially I set the, the resolution way down low so it runs really, really fast. I know I'm getting horribly inaccurate answers, but what I'm looking for at this point is just, are there mistakes in the code? Do my graphics look good? And I, I get everything looking good, running crisp, get all the errors out of my code. And finally, at the very end, when I'm ready to get that final answer, I will crank up my grid resolution. I will look for convergence in a more sophisticated way, something like this. So I crank it up at the very last minute and run that final simulation. So here are the conclusions. And so I, I've mentioned this at least three times. Remember, I think this is probably the most important thing in this lecture. The equations I gave for calculating the delta x, delta y, delta z, we're only in one dimension now, so it's just delta z. But those equations I gave are just rules of thumb. It's just a good first guess as to what those parameters need to be for the time step and the grid resolution. The real way to determine what those are is to look for convergence. We keep making them smaller and smaller and smaller and observe the trend in our answer. And when our answer, maybe that's a reflectance and transmittance plot, when that answer is no longer changing significantly, we would say that our model is converged. And any time you get an answer out of a model, convergence should be made a habit. It should always, always look for convergence. And in fact, the most commercial software, this is built right in. It has what's called an adaptive mesh, usually a finite element method. So it meshes the problem, in other words, it chooses the grid, it runs a simulation, then it refines the mesh. It uses smaller cells and reruns the simulation. And it keeps doing that and adapting its grid until the answer doesn't change anymore. And a lot of times we don't even know that's happening on the outside. We just say run, simulate, and out comes an answer. But underneath the hood, it's doing a convergence sweep. Now our codes that we're writing aren't so sophisticated, so the convergence will be much more manual. It'll just be us changing the resolution, getting the next answer, and observing a trend, and then uh, you know, making a judgment of where we say that the, the model is sufficiently converged. Okay, incorporating loss. So we really ignored loss in our formulation. We just had a permittivity and permeability. It might be tempting to say, oh, well, I know if there's loss, we just make the permittivity or permeability a complex number. However, that is a frequency domain concept. That does not work in the time domain. Everything in the time domain has a real number. So we need to do it a different way. So we started here, and notice in this case, we're going to retain this current term, because in fact, this is how we'll account for our loss. This is a simple way of accounting for loss. So here's our Maxwell's equations and constitutive relations. So that's our starting point. Remember that this current density is equal to the conductivity times the electric field. So we can substitute our constitutive relations into Maxwell's equations and also replace this current density with the conductivity times the electric field, and we end up with two curl equations with the constitutive relations substituted them in and also this current term. But we have two equations now and two unknowns, E and H. That means this is a solvable problem. And our loss comes into this through the conductivity. We have a purely real relative permittivity and a purely real relative permeability. Again, we'll normalize the magnetic field. It doesn't matter which one we normalize, the magnetic or the electric field. It's actually a bit more of a convention in finite difference time domain to normalize the electric field. And when we go to two and three dimensional simulations, we'll do that. That way you will have seen both. But right now in one dimension, we'll stick with normalizing the magnetic field. And we put the normalized magnetic field into Maxwell's equations, and we get a somewhat familiar looking form. We're going to follow the exact same procedure we did before to eventually derive our update equations. Maxwell's equations, we normalize, we simplify, then we expand into the component equations, find a difference approximations, reduce down to one dimension, and then solve for the fields at the future time values, and those are update equations. We will follow that same procedure here, but we're going to leave this that conductivity term in and see what happens. So we take this curl equation that has the conductivity and we expand that vector equation into three coupled partial differential equations. So nothing should be too much of a surprise here. 
Now we'll take one of those partial differential equations and we will write it in its finite difference form. So three of the terms here we've already done. So we have the partial derivative of h sub z in the y direction. We've, we've done this before. And here's the finite difference approximation for that derivative. We have our second derivative, partial of h sub y in the z direction. Here's our finite difference approximation. And we have this last term where we're approximating the time derivative. And here is that expression in finite difference form. But here's this new term that we have. Well, a to naught is the free space impedance. That's just a constant. So that just comes down here. We could potentially have a different conductivity at each point in the grid. So we give it ijk indices. And then it's just the electric field. There's no derivatives or anything, so we bring it down. But let's think about the time here. What do we use? Do we use e at t, or do we use the e at t plus delta t? Well, here's our time finite difference. We are taking the difference between e at the future time step minus e at the previous time step divided by the duration of the time step. Rise over run, that's our first order derivative. This is a central finite difference, and in time, it actually exists at the midpoint between these two terms, which is t plus delta t over two. That's where all of our magnetic fields exist in time, t plus delta t over two. So, remember our, our golden rule for finite difference equations, every term in that equation must exist at the same point in time and space. Well, in terms of space, this electric field exists at the same point as all the terms in the equation. That's not the problem, it's the time the E field exists at integer time steps. It does not exist at t plus delta t over two. So how do we handle this? We only know the electric field at integer time steps. We need it at a half time step. So the answer is we interpolate it, we average it. If we average the electric field at the previous time step with the electric field at the new time step, so we add them, divide by two, we've essentially interpolated anyway to first order the electric field at the half time step. So that's exactly what we do. We interpolate, we put in the average. Otherwise, all the other terms are the same. Now, all the terms in this finite difference equation exist at the same point in time and space. We have a slightly more complicated equation, and now we have two electric fields at the future time step, so we have a little bit more algebra to do when we derive the update equation because we have to solve for that term. So here we have a close-up view of our finite difference equation, and this is the first step in deriving the update equation where we have to solve for the electric field at the future time step. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, notice this occurs in two places. So unfortunately, the math here is a little bit uglier. It's not too bad algebraically, but what we'll see is that our update coefficients get a bit uglier. So what I like to do is look at the right-hand side and expand everything out. So now we write it as four separate electric field terms. Then we collect the common coefficients, so we only have two electric field terms instead of having the four that we started with. Now that we have this term isolated, we can solve for it. And working through the algebra, here's where we are. The electric field at the future time step is some big ugly coefficient times the electric field at the present time step plus another big ugly coefficient, times the curl of the H field. Now notice all of the terms in these big ugly uh, parentheses here, these big ugly expressions, these don't change during the course of the simulation, so we can calculate them ahead of time, and those are our update coefficients. And so it makes a little more sense now why we're pre-calculating those update coefficients. And when we add the perfectly matched layer boundary condition, when we go to two and three dimensions, these get even uglier than this. So here's how we'll implement the update equation. Our electric field at the future time step is some update coefficient times the electric field at the previous time step plus another update coefficient different than this first one times the curl of the magnetic field. And so doing a little more algebra to simplify these, here's our final expressions for our two update coefficients. So we've done it. There is our update equation and now this has loss incorporated. Here's a great self-check to see if this is correct. Well, in fact, the self-check won't tell if it's correct. It'll just tell us that it's not necessarily wrong. 
And so if we turn off the loss, we set all those conductivity terms to zero, our update coefficient should reduce down to what we derived previously. So let's see if that happens. All the sigma terms appear in the update coefficients. So here's our expression for the update coefficients. Anywhere there's a sigma term, we just cross it off. When we do that, we have the ratio of two similar things. So this first update coefficient is just a one. So in other words, this update coefficient really isn't even here. Our next update coefficient reduces down to this. And so this should look familiar as the, the single update coefficient we had previously. But now that we have loss, we'll have two update coefficients. And the last subject, and the most difficult, this is not something we'll do this semester, but I do want you to see it. Uh, and there's other ways of incorporating frequency dependent materials. Um, but I, I think the one I'm gonna show you is the more meaningful. I think it's better in an academic environment because all the intermediate parameters that we're going to introduce to do this have physical meaning that we can visualize and learn from. But there are other ways and they're definitely more efficient but I really like the way that I'm going to show you, just due to the intermediate parameters having physical meaning. So if we have a frequency dependent material, uh, we tend to think in the frequency domain for some reason. This means different frequencies will see different electromagnetic properties. The permittivity, the permeability, maybe even the conductivity are different depending on frequency. Well, if they change in frequency, that also means that these will be functions of time. Well, if our permeability and permittivity are functions of time, remember those constitutive relations were originally convolutions. So we actually have to do a convolution in our code now. And so that introduces a bit of complexity. So we're going to go to this more generalized flow of Maxwell's equations where we pull the constitutive relation out. And here we will update the B field based on the curl of the E field, then calculate H from B, then update the D field from the curl of H, then calculate E from D. So we'll use this generalized model. We've been working with this just EH, EH, EH model, but let's separate these and, and we'll see why that's useful in a, in a few slides. But now we need four sets of update equations, not just two. Before we get into this, we have to talk a little bit about some theory. And we need to understand why materials even have a dielectric response to begin with, because that's going to give us some clues of what we can do to incorporate this into our model. So imagine we have a nucleus, and that's this little red dot here. And we have an electron cloud buzzing around it. And as long as there's no applied electric fields and everything's sort of in its normal state, this electron cloud is rather symmetric around the nucleus. If we then suddenly apply an electric field, the nucleus and the electron cloud have opposite charge. They will pull apart from each other. And when this happens, we actually are stretching these little electron clouds. We call the material, we call it being polarized not to be confused with the polarization of an electromagnetic wave. This is the material becoming polarized, if you will. Now, these have mass. Your electron cloud has mass. The, the nucleus has a mass. So there's a very good model that we can use. We can say that this electron cloud is stuck to the nucleus, similar to how a mass on a spring behaves. As we pull this electron cloud away with the applied force of the electric field, the the Coulomb attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud wants to pull it back. Just like when we pull this weight down, the spring wants to pull it back. And there's a resonant frequency here. If we were to pull this back and let it go, that electron cloud would swish back and forth. It would boing like a spring. So it's actually a very good analogy. And given this analogy, we can write an equation of motion for this system. So we're going back to mechanics for this. We have our acceleration force. We have a frictional force. We have the restoring force, so that's either the, the Coulomb attraction or the spring force. And then we have the driving force, the thing that's causing the system to move anyway. So this comes from mechanics. And through a series of steps, we can go from this equation of motion 
to an equation that gives us our relative permittivity in terms of the parameters in this equation, which are the, the mass of the electron, the, 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 the loss terms, and we also get this, this is called the plasma frequency. Um, we're not going to delve too much into the meaning of plasma frequency in this. Uh, we do talk about that in depth in my 21st century electromagnetics class, and those, those lectures are available online. Suffice to say, uh, every material has a plasma frequency, and uh, they're, they're most meaningful in a metal. Above the plasma frequency, metals really aren't even metals. They behave like weakly absorbing dielectrics, and waves can pass right through metals. Below the plasma frequency, they behave like metals. And it's not a sharp cutoff, but that's the plasma frequency. Here we don't need to know that. Uh, it's just a collection of terms that comes out of the equation of motion. And so we now we have an expression for how the, the permittivity is a function of frequency. So there's only, a, there's only a certain number of ways that that permittivity can change as a function of frequency, and here we've calculated that. Here's what a typical Lorentz response looks like. And the blue line here is the real part of permittivity. And what we see around where the thing is resonant, we see the permittivity increase. And on the resonance, it drops very sharply and then starts increasing again. And if we look at the imaginary part, that spikes on resonance and disappears away. And this is really telling us that we're going to have loss. However, the imaginary part is not solely responsible for loss. Instead, if we then calculate the refractive index, that isolates the loss into the imaginary part of refractive index. And what we see is that still spikes in the vicinity of the, of the resonance. And we also see the refractive index has a similar kind of thing where it's increasing, increasing, increasing. That's positive dispersion. On resonance, it drops very sharply, but then it comes up and increases, increases, and, and increases. And way off to infinity, all materials just behave like outer space, like it's absolutely nothing. Below the resonance, we see this offset on the real part, both the permittivity and refractive index, but the loss term still goes to zero. But we get an offset in the real part far below resonance. Above resonance, we get no offset. It goes to zero. And then on resonance, it gets kind of crazy. And in that 21st century electromagnetics class, we talk a lot more about this, if this is of interest, and how we can use that to design devices. And we also go on to show how metamaterials work in the same sort of concept. So I'm not going to talk about that here, but I'll refer you to the lectures in the 21st century electromagnetics class. So the Lorentz model is very good for dielectrics, and it turns out we can reduce that down to do something to model metals. So what's the difference between a dielectric and a metal? In a metal, our charges are free to move. So in fact, that restoring force, or the spring, is no longer there. So we go into our equation for permittivity from the Lorentz model, and we just set that restoring term to zero. We get rid of it. And we end up with what's called the Drude model for metals. And we still have this plasma frequency. Remind you, the plasma frequency for metals above the plasma frequency it doesn't act like a metal at all. Below the plasma frequency it does, but it's not a very sharp cutoff. And here's the typical Drude response where you can see that it's not a real sharp cutoff. The plasma frequency is this dashed line. And so what we see is above the plasma frequency, the loss in the metal is negligible. The dielectric constant is one. It's just acting like outer space. It's a little bit different as we approach it, but it, it's definitely not acting like a metal. Below the plasma frequency, the real part of the permittivity becomes very large and very negative, and the loss term takes off to eventually infinity when it gets to zero frequency. So out here, it's definitely acting like a good metal. As we approach the plasma frequency, yeah, not so much. This is not a very sharp cutoff, but above it, it definitely is not acting like a metal. And we can see the same thing if we look at refractive index versus frequency that we saw up here. Now, actual materials don't just have one resonant frequency. They have many. They could have dozens, and they're all superimposed and overlapping. And so this typical Lorentz response or Drude response that we're seeing could be more complicated if they're overlapping. So 
we can model dispersive materials as having a series of resonances. We just have to figure out the resonant frequencies. We have to figure out their damping rates or the loss. And we'll also give them an oscillator strength because some resonances are just stronger than others. But even though we have multiple resonances, a certain material only ever has one plasma frequency. So something kind of neat happens here when we look at multiple resonances. In this plot down below, I've separated the resonances so you can see them distinctly. In reality, they, they tend to overlap more, and so they start to look uglier and not necessarily look Lorentz-like. But notice 99% of the time here, our permittivity is increasing. Yet, the overall trend is to go down. And so let's look at why that is. Notice the permittivity is increasing, 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 but now we have a huge jump down. On, the, on this particular resonance. Then it increases, 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 and a huge jump down. So the overall trend is to go down. And eventually out at infinity, we just see a, a permittivity of one. It's transparent, doesn't look like anything. But we have some offset. And in fact, down here, this is the offset contribute has contributions from all the resonances. So this is the offset from all of them combined. So that's a real material. So the point is, we are going to model dispersive materials where the permittivity can change with frequency as a sum of multiple resonances, and we can choose as many as we want. So let's go back to the constitutive relation. We're in the frequency domain now, so it's not a convolution. So D just equals epsilon times E, but we can write this slightly differently now. We can write this as a D equaling the free space response of the electric field plus the ability to put in a constant permittivity here. And that can be sort of our background constant permittivity. We'll talk more about what that is. But think of this as just the free space response, the vacuum response, plus the material polarization. This is where we'll put all of the dispersive stuff. So we write our material polarization simply as the plasma frequency times the electric field, and then add up all of the different resonances. Remember, we're in the frequency domain. So for a single resonance, here's what our polarization looks like. Now we want to do some algebra here. So we'll take this denominator, multiply both sides, and we end up here. Now this is a form that we can convert easily to the time domain. Anywhere we're multiplying by j omega, that's a time derivative. So a j omega squared is a second order time derivative. This j omega would just be a first order time derivative. So we have a frequency domain equation that we can then write in the time domain. And we'll do a little bit more algebra and we end up here. So now we have a time domain equation. It's a second order differential equation for the polarization of the material in time for a single resonance. So we don't want the second order derivative. So what we'll do, and remember the polarization is just the offset of charges. It's sort of stretched charges. Well, when they're moving, when this is changing with time, that is actually a current. And it's called a displacement current. So we'll call that J. And the subscript M means it's for the mth oscillation. Remember, we're summing a bunch of different potential resonances. So this is just for the nth resonance. So that displacement current is simply the derivative of P. So we go back to that second order differential equation for P. And where we see the second order derivative for P, we will put in the first order derivative of J. Now we have two equations only with first order time derivatives. But we have polarization and polarization current. And we have one of those for every resonance that we've included in our dispersion model. So let's think about our update equations for P. We have this equation that relates the displacement current to the material polarization. It's just a first order derivative. So we approximate this with a finite difference and then we see that P and J have to be offset in time. We will define P to be at integer time steps and we'll define j to be at the half time steps. So p will exist at the same uh, points in time as the electric fields, and j will exist at the same point in times as the magnetic fields. 
And so then we solve for the future value of P, and we end up with three update equations for the polarization. And this is for the nth resonance. So if we're modeling a dispersive material with 10 resonances, for every point in the grid, we need to be updating an X, Y, and Z component of the polarization for each one of those resonances. We have to update J. So we go back to our other differential equation that contained both J and P. We'll approximate our derivatives with finite differences, solve for J at the future time value. There's two of them, so we expect the math to get a little bit crazy. And here's our update equation for J. And to update J, we not only need the previous value of J, we need the polarization and the electric field. All of that come in, comes into play here. Finally, we need our update equation for the electric field. So we go back to our constitutive relation. And so D equals our free space response of the electric field. Plus, we have to sum all of those individual material polarizations that we're calculating in the background. Then we approximate this with finite differences. There aren't any really finite differences here, but we, we have our IJK indices now. And so we solve this equation for the electric field. And so we end up here in this form. So this becomes our update equation for the electric field. So that's how we calculate the electric field from the D field, also with the material polarization in there. So let's lump all this together. Let's focus on just the main FDTD loop. How on earth do we modify this to, to incorporate dispersion? Well, we update H from E. That does not change from how we've discussed. We handle the total field scatter field source in H just as we've discussed. At this point, we update J from P and E. So we have our update equation for the displacement current. Then we update the polarization. We update P from J. Now remember, we'll be doing this for every point in the grid that has a dispersive material and for every resonance that we're modeling it with. So if we have 100 points in the grid that have a certain dispersive material and we're modeling it with five resonances, we have 50 J's and P's in addition to 50 E's and D's that we're updating at each one of those cells. Well, once we know J and P, uh, we can update D from H. We'll handle a total field scatter force in D. Then we update E from D, which includes P and J. Uh, in this update equation. And then that repeats. Update H from E, handle the H field source, update J from P and E, update P from J, update D from H, handle the total field scatter field source in terms of the D field, then update E from D and also the material polarization. So a bit more complicated and there are more efficient ways for incorporating dispersed materials. There's a Z transform method that's very neat. Uh, and other techniques. But here we have material polarization and the displacement current. And these are physical terms. These have physical meaning that we could visualize and maybe learn something from. So in an academic environment, I really like this way of incorporating dispersive materials.